Hey pals, welcome back to another video. Today, we're gonna to talk about immunosenescence and its possible links and connections with COVID-19, the novel human coronavirus infectious disease that is changing the landscape of the world. I have some papers and instead of trying to read them to you and show them to you like this, what I might do is just flash up some of the papers, but I wanna start off with a hypothesis. Again, this is Mike Mutzel speaking. I'm not an infectious disease expert. I'm not an immunologist. Uh, I do study immunology extensively. I read the research. I collaborate in, in email with some of the researchers via email. I've interviewed people uh, from Stanford University and other universities that study these things. So I'm, I, I love immunology, but I just want to offer this disclaimer. Um, this video is not to be taken as medical advice. So you got to work with your doctor, practitioner, etc. And I, I could be wrong about my hypothesis, but here's my hypothesis. And I would love for someone to try to prove me wrong. My hypothesis is that, and again, this is March 30th, Monday, when I'm recording this. Again, it could be wrong, but based upon the preponderance of data that seems to be emerging from peer-reviewed medical journals, it seems that part of the problems and the links with increased disease severity when individuals are infected with this novel human coronavirus, part of that complication arises from a form of immunosenescence. I'll, I'll define all that in a second. Let me just kind of finish the hypothesis. And that leads to increased morbidity and mortality. And the reason why I am proposing this hypothesis, and it's not based upon just me drumming this stuff up, there's ample data that have found clinical characteristics in individuals that are infected with this novel human coronavirus and looked at various natural killer cell and CD8 T helper cell checkpoint inhibitors that are increased. Uh, these are inhibitors that are basically receptors on the cell surface of natural killer cells and CD8 T helper cells that are increased, suggesting there's some sort of functional exhaustion or immunosenescence occurring. And what some of the papers have found, again, this is just retrospective data. This isn't an interventional randomized clinical study, but what some of the research papers have found that in individuals um, at the peak of their disease severity and after in remission, when they're recovering from this, these immune cell checkpoint inhibitors are actually reduced. And so that shows that potentially they were able to surmount this infection uh, and overcome it. And, you know, they didn't have this immunosenescence within their immune system. So let me just quickly define what cellular senescence is. Uh, this is kind of a cellular characteristic of increased cellular aging. Uh, you can learn a little bit more about it, uh, a lot more about it, actually, with a recent podcast I did with nurse practitioner Jeff Grimm in Portland, Oregon. I will put that here and link it below. It's an amazing discussion. We talk about cellular senescence, senolytic therapies, which are therapies to help purge these kind of advanced age cells from our body. They've evaded cellular apoptosis, so they should be dead, but they're still alive. But what's bad about these senescent cells is they release a bunch of this secretome, uh, this senescence secretome that causes other cells to misbehave in, in those regions. And so I have this, again, this hypothesis based upon the increased disease severity in individuals that have comorbidities that are linked with cellular senescence and advanced cellular age, namely hypertension. Hypertension, there's been quite a few animal model studies and tissue culture studies and human studies that have shown that um, hypertensive blood vessels are characterized by their old. Uh, I think about like a, a hose, a garden hose, that's been sitting outside uh, getting beat up by the sun. It's gonna be stiff, it's gonna be rigid. And uh, again, one of the most common uh, comorbidities in those with uh, severe COVID-19 disease and those that die from this infection is hypertension. We also know that uh, congestive heart failure and cerebrovascular disease, those people that have had a stroke before, and diabetes, similarly, are, are other comorbidities that are fre frequently reported to be uh, 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 common amongst individuals with uh, disease severity. And this was from Wuhan, China. Uh, this was data from Italy, from Itali the Italian CDC. This is also real-time data coming from the New York, uh, state of New York public health. Uh, if you look at some of the mortality data from there that's being published twice a day, you can find this for free on the internet. I, I check it every day. And again, they're showing uh, mortality uh, in individuals with no diagnosed disease comorbidities and individuals that have disease comorbidities. And there's a huge disparity. Uh, about 80% of the fatalities in all ages between 18 to 75, 80% uh, of those individuals have some sort of disease comorbidity. 
So again, you know, going back to this immunosenescence concept, uh, I want you to understand and, and maybe take note of this um, natural killer cell checkpoint inhibitor called NKG2A. Um, and there's also NK for natural killer cell G2D. Uh, one is an activator, one's an inhibitor. And so individuals, and this is where we can kind of the action steps from this video per this hypothesis that I've been thinking about for the past couple of weeks about this idea that individuals that have advanced biological age might have more senescent cells within their body and also their immune system, which might lend their immune system to not be able to properly surmount uh, an appropriate or mount an appropriate immune response when they are infected with this novel SARS-CoV-2 human coronavirus and therefore they have um, increased disease severity and poor uh, outcomes and even death. And so because we're, we're not seeing a very consistent trend with age, um, there are still people in the 18 to 44 group uh, in Italy and also in New York that are dying. So you're like, well, is it just age? I mean, yeah, you see people over the age of 60, there is a, a more of a steep increase in terms of uh, the propensity or the, the the odds, shall we say, in terms of the reports of, of mortality. But there is the previously healthy 30-year-old that's on the ventilator and is intubated and has been in the ICU for two weeks. I mean, we're hearing these stories in case histories. And so what I want you to take away from this is just because your chronological age says that you're 32, it doesn't mean that your biological age is 32. You could be 22, you could be 44, you could be 54. And so I think this is the, the take-home message for changing your diet and lifestyle henceforth from this point on. You know, a lot of people, I went by McDonald's this morning. People shouldn't be eating fast food right now, eating sugar. There was a, a huge line in the, in the drive-thru. Look, I know people have to eat. You can probably make some reasonably healthy choices at McDonald's, taking the bun off the burger, et cetera. But still, uh, it leads me to think that people are having French fries and milkshakes and, and soda pops and things like that, Okay. So we know that bouts of hyperglycemia, chronic insidious inflammation that's characterized and associated with diet and lifestyle induced diseases uh, is linked with cellular senescence and immunosenescence and advanced aging of the immune system and of the body. It's interesting, as I'm filming this video, I'm seeing like tons of cop cars fly by with their lights on. I don't know what the hell is going on. It's kind of crazy. I'm going to leave that in. I'm not going to edit that. Um, anyway, the... It, we all want life to get back to normal, and I hope that happens very soon. And part of this video is to give you the impetus to start doing some sort of feeding window compression, some sort of daily, consistent, intermittent fasting, time-restricted feeding protocol, because it's very important uh, for your own health and for your own mental well-being, because during this time, I mean, we're spending time indoors, kids are out of school, we're stressed, like the pantry's right there, the refrigerator's right there. I think it's important that just, if nothing else, for preventing the COVID-15, gaining like 15 pounds during this period, we, we really got to implement some sort of time-restricted feeding intermittent fasting protocol. I'm just eating two meals a day when I train, I'm fasting on Mondays, and uh, one meal a day when I'm not training. And we have a decent home gym, not great, but enough to get by. So that's what I'm doing. And what does fasting have to do with this? Well, you know the work from Walter Longo has shown that um, you know we can purge some of these senescent cells, that we can get this purge of stem cells, which can really help the immune system uh, and so forth. Again, this is mostly data in animals at this point using the so-called fasting mimicking diet. But this is where lifestyle and diet strategies and feeding and fasting come into the picture. And what I want you to understand as well is scientists have been looking at potentially using stem cells in individuals with severe COVID-19 disease and priming them with interferon as they're injecting the stem cells so that they know what to do because interferon, I th it directs a natural killer cell and other stem cell differentiation. So uh, very interesting stuff to know that even scientists are, are looking at maybe, hey, would stem cell therapy help in these individuals that have really severe disease because their immune system is exhausted, okay? Now, is their immune system exhausted because it's being burdened by the other non-communicable diseases that they're suffering from? Heart disease, cardiovascular disease, <laughs> hypertension, diabetes, things along those lines. So it's possible that if we think about our body like a computer, Right. If your computer is so busy doing other things, editing music, exporting music, watching videos, uh, you know, running PowerPoint presentations, 
well, what's left over for checking your email, right? Or what's left over for combating uh, or a virus that's trying to infect the computer, right? So you can liken your body's bandwidth, it's finite, it's not unlimited. So if you're already having a lot of smoldering chronic inflammation, your immune system is already, uh, the cellular age of your immune system is advanced because of the diseases that you currently have, then you bake in a virus, whether it's SARS, COV, or uh, yeah, something else, guess what? There's not a lot of left over uh, to surmount the infection. And I think that's what the data is emerging to show. But uh, I will be posting other uh, videos to talk more about this concept, to explain to you a little bit more about cellular senescence, immunosenescence in the context of lifestyle and aging in general, but specifically as it relates to this COVID-19, as the papers do emerge. Uh, I think it's a fascinating concept. I just love immunobiology and immunopathology in general. Uh, but I think, you know, the onus is on us to change our diet and lifestyle so that whatever infectious disease, pandemic, or epidemic that we're exposed to in the future, we're more resilient as humans. So uh, that's what's going on. The papers that I use to get educated on this topic will be linked below. Also on my website for our members, what I'm doing is sending the full text PDFs and a little summary. So if you want to check out our Patreon members area, you can do so. But uh, hopefully you found this helpful. I wasn't trying to lose you with any complex jargon or biochemistry, but we did need to talk about the natural killer cell G28 receptors and all these things uh, just to talk to you about activating versus inhibiting uh, the immune system. But uh, thank you again for tuning in. Hopefully this was helpful and we'll catch you on a future episode down the road. Bye guys.